I'm Dr. G, and for the past 10 years of my life, I've been passionate about all things holistic healing. I've been committed to healing myself and others from the inside out by incorporating some of the most effective modalities for healing the mental, the emotional, and the physical. I've learned that they give us the opportunity to be our most authentic and powerful selves. Heal Thyself is a show dedicated to just that. Today's show is going to be incredible, and I say it every week, of course I do, because it is incredible. Knowledge bombs of digestible information to empower and create clarity on what the highest version of us looks like. Product reviews to provide informed consent so you can buy the safest and best products out there. Better than the first two that I spoke about, and you're getting other B vitamins, which are energizing, right? Get off of it, throw it away. And special guest segments with some of the brightest and most elite minds in their field. So what is that like on my nervous system? Six hours of holding that emotion. Here's the earth, here's the mechanisms and mechanics of an earth when it breathes. We would think much different about that asthma patient that shows up. All to create change and all the parts that make you, you, so we can start healing ourselves and each other. All right, everyone, welcome to Heal Thyself. Thank you, as always, for taking the time out of your day and spending it with us on the show. And uh, so much to uh, really, really put out there today. Good information, really good stuff. Um, as you know, we are always, and I'm doing my best here to give you the free information, the best you can do with the least amount of money, with the biggest bang for your buck. And one of those things is getting back into your body. So I'm gonna tell you guys a little story that I went through uh, just yesterday and uh, learning how to get back in my body and the importance of it and what it means right? And how we can all access that. So there's a little technique that I want to share with you. Also, we have a very special guest today, Lauren Mones, and she is the fermenting fairy and she is all things knowledge in fermented foods. And it's going to be really important this conversation because she's going to answer a lot of questions about some really, really important food groups in our life. Now, you know that I'm such a proponent of fermented foods, right? Because what they do to help restore, rebalance, and rejuvenate our gut right? And we know that so much of our health comes from our gut. So Lauren is going to tell us all the lowdown in the industry and answer questions that I'm itching to know. Like, is kombucha healthy? Should we be drinking it? What is the industry looking like? How is it moving? Uh, Are they using additives, substitutes? Are companies that are leading the push in fermented foods, what are they about, right? And where is the whole industry going? So it's really important because we need to know where we can source the best fermented foods and why we should be eating it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but really, really answer all these amazing questions. So uh, without further ado, let's get to this show. First, a word from our sponsors, and then we're going to get deep into this knowledge bomb. I know a lot of you are super stressed for the holidays. It just, it's always like that. And um, I myself became super stressed when I found out how expensive tickets are to New Jersey. But uh, as always, we're running around, especially last minute, getting gifts and you know setting up all the logistics to have a holiday. But I want to submit something today. Ned has an awesome CBD that I've been using for quite a while. It's helpful for the nervous system. It's helpful for my nervous system, for stress and anxiety in particular. Now, the thing about Ned as a company is it's an amazing company, USDA certified organic. All of their hemp oil is extracted from organic hemp plants, and it's grown by an independent farmer. His name's Jonathan. You can see it online in Paonia, Colorado. And the products are science-based. They're nature-based. They're solutions and an alternative to a lot of the crap we're putting in our bodies to suppress our nervous system. What this is doing is working with our nervous system. And their products are full of premium CBD, full of active cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, and trichomes. They have a full spectrum hemp. It nourishes the body's endocannabinoid system. And what that does is offer us our solutions for stress, sleep, inflammation, balance. We all have that system and it all works with CBD. So they made an incredible blend this past year. It's called the De-Stress Blend and it's a one-to-one formula of CBD and CBG. And it's the world's purest full spectrum hemp and a feature of botanical infusions of ashwagandha, cardamom, and cinnamon. Back to the CBG that I just mentioned. 
This is known as the mother of all cannabinoids because of how effective it is at combating anxiety and stress. How does it do that? Well, it inhibits the reuptake of a neurotransmitter called GABA. And it's responsible for the regulation of our stress. But it also, as I mentioned, has ashwagandha. It's my favorite Ayurvedic adaptogen because it enhances your body's own resiliency to stress. And lastly, the cardamom and cinnamon that I mentioned, what that does is not only add to a delicious taste for it, but cinnamon in itself is a powerful prebiotic. So that's supporting your gut health, where a lot of your mental health, it's a key player to your mental health, is coming from. And then cardamom, which helps reduce our stress and blood pressure and cortisol levels. So full transparency. Ned is full of transparency. They have third-party reports on their website. You can access them yourselves. It'll show who farms their products, how it's extracted, all right there on the site, and you'll be able to see pesticides, heavy metals, mold, everything. All right, so all of my Heal Thyself listeners, you're going to get 20% off of Ned with the code DRG. When you spend more than 150 bucks, Ned is throwing in free gifts with every order. So go to helloned.com slash DRG and you're going to get access. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash DRG. You're going to get 20% plus free gifts with orders over 150. And as always, Ned, a longtime sponsor, thank you for this gift. All right, everyone, I want to talk about my bed. And it's a Birch bed. And Birch is an amazing company. So it's a premium mattress in a box company. And they make mattresses and sleep products, super stylish, comfortable, environmentally conscious, and my favorite one of all, non-toxic. They have an organic non-toxic mattress made right here in America. And I recently introduced the Birch Lux Natural Mattress. That's the upgrade of the Birch Natural Mattress, the well-loved one and the popular one. Their new Lux mattress is responsibly sourced and sustainably produced. It's made of organic cashmere, organic New Zealand wool, fair trade cotton, and pulse latex. It has eight different layers, and the Lux was specially created for breathability and support in mind, so you're not overheating in bed like so many people who run hot do. Now it's made with eight different layers, and it's created, as I mentioned, for that breathability and comfort throughout the night. It's natural, non-toxic, and the beautiful thing is that it's constructed to relieve pressure points in your body so you get a better night's sleep. And it has targeted zone lumbar support, which provides enhanced contouring when you're laying on it. So the mattress has over 1,000 individually wrapped steel coils that cradles your body like you're in a cloud. So each Birch mattress comes with two of their Eco Rest pillows, and it's made from recycled plastic bottles. They're breathable and better for the environment. But as always, here's my favorite. Birch Lux has all of the third-party certifications that you look for. When you get a mattress, you better make sure that they have these certifications. Got certified. That means that it's certified Global Organic Textile Standard, the leading textile processing standard for organic fibers across the globe. So you know that the materials being used are high quality. And then there's the Green Guard Gold Certified. That means it's free of any polyurethane-based foams, which a lot of the tempur mattresses are made out of, which excrete nasty volatile organic compounds and unnecessary chemicals and pollutants. So what I love about my Birch Lux mattress, it's organic, it's clean, non-toxic, it's breathable, and yes, I can attest to the pressure point relief. Very, very good sleep. The best sleep scores I've had of my life on my sleep tracker, so it's amazing stuff. When you get your Birch mattress, you're gonna get a 100 night sleep trial with a 25 year warranty. So if it makes you nervous to invest in something like this, you take three months, See if you like it. If you don't, you're going to get a full refund and they're going to come pick it up. So I love my Birch mattress. I do think you will love it too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Birch. Go to www.birchliving.com slash heal thyself. You're going to get $400 off of your mattress and those two free pillows. All right, I want to open up and share a uh, story uh, of a... Uh, visit that I had yesterday. And uh, I went to these this awesome couple's place. They're called the Love Gurus, right? And I found them online. And I actually heard a lot of really, really good stuff about them. So I was super excited to meeting with them. And uh, we had a discovery call and the energy was there. The alignment was there. It felt good, right? If you want to really see if something is in alignment with you, see how you feel in your body before something happens, right? And then when the intervention happens, like a phone call, see how you feel after. And what I found was that I felt really good and rejuvenated. And I wanted to go because as you know, and probably have deduced by now, I am always looking to expand and expand 
uh, in my physical health, mental, emotional, spiritual health, so I can serve humanity better. Uh, so I go to their house and I meet an amazing couple. And we sit down and we talk. We talk about my upbringing. We talk about my relationship with everything, my relationship with relationships, with my relationship with love, my relationship with myself, um, my relationship with sex, relationship with family, friends, everything, right? And it was amazing. Like, it was, first of all, the setting was beautiful. They had, a, 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 like, the, for me, lighting is so important. I have to feel good when I'm ready to open up myself uh, and be vulnerable, right? So beautiful, like, setting candles and you know, Himalayan lamps. So I was already feeling good in my body to be open. But the reason I went there is because I'm looking to expand myself and uh, be deeper and show up better in love, right? And partnership. And I'm in, I am in partnership. So to show up in partnership, it's important for me to know myself better and obviously to love myself better so I can show up for another and love them, right? And know them and allow that deeper bond between us. So learning more about myself through conversation. And then, so that was the therapy session. We can say the talk therapy. And then the second part was the body work, which is the thing that I look most interested into all the time because the body work is where all of that stuff is, right? And immediately I'm laying down and, uh, and the, the, the female uh, of the two t touches my stomach and she goes, you are so tense. And I started thinking to myself, I go, I don't feel that tense. And then I started coming into my body and she's like, okay, feel your whole body, right? Go from your head to your neck, to your chest, to your stomach, to your hips, to your knees, to your feet, and feel if you're tense. And she goes, where do you feel tension? And then right when I was going to say it, she's like, here, right? And I go, yes, yes. How'd you know? And she's like, it's visible. You can see how much tension your body's holding. And then I go, okay, here too. And she's like, yeah. And then she's like, how about here? I go, yes, that's the most tension. So the whole point of this is that I want to tell people that maybe, just maybe we hold in a lot more tension than we realized. And that's a problem. And here's why. Because when we're holding in tension, we're blocking so much. We're blocking everything. And as I was in this visit and actually learning how to connect to my body, which so many, so many of us, they were saying that Osho has this quote that 99.9% .9 of people in the world have no idea how to connect to their body. I may be misquoting that, but that's what I remember. But regardless, connecting to your body is everything, right? Now, you may have seen me this week put up a bunch of stories on trauma. And so many people are like, how do you do it? How do you do it? And, I, and the second day I, I laid out some few steps and it, it involves getting quiet. But the way to release trauma, the way to move energy out of your body is to get out of your mind and into your body, which is, which is crazy because we, we think so much as cerebral and logical beings, we want to define everything. And we are so good in humanity to define things and define concepts, right? We want to know why, where, what, how, so we can give it a name and then understand ourselves better. The irony though, is that the body doesn't care about definitions at all. The only thing the body cares about is homeostasis. The only thing the body cares about is coming back into balance. So when we are out of balance, it stands to believe then we have to surrender to the body so it can get back in balance, right? So I'm laying here and she's pointing out the tension that's in my body. And for the first time in a really, really long time, I fully surrendered and pay attention to my body. And I noticed exactly where I hold the tension. Now the tension, I'll go back to what I was saying before. Tension is an incredible way to block you from everything, especially your own intuition. And, you know, so many of us really want to strengthen our intuition because that's our compass in life, right? You want to know where to go? Listen, listen to your intuition. You want to know, know, know who to speak to, how to speak to them? Listen to your intuition. You want to know if something's true, whether it be with your family, with work, with your upbringing, with your whole story, with your whole life. If it's true, listen to your intuition. But the very thing that blocks intuition more than anything is tension, tension in our bodies. And when we can't come back into our bodies, then we're blocking ourselves from that deep, deep, deep understanding of intuition, that compass that is us. We also block ourselves from health, right? We don't allow health to flow from our bodies. Why? 
Because physiologically, when we're in tension, that means we're in sympathetic dominant mode. And if we're in sympathetic dominant mode, our nervous system is feeling unsafe. And if, you, if you're if you tense most of the time, like me, actually, then you're sympathetically dominant. Now, why is another reason, right? The body doesn't care about the why. It cares about removing that energy. But a lot of us are tense because of our environments, right? How we grew up or, or what school was like or... Uh, if, if we ever felt unsafe in our lives, right? It doesn't matter uh, the where, but the, ten, the, the byproduct or the product is tension in our body. So I actually challenge all of you right now while you're listening to lay down, find a place on a rug, lay some pillows down if you're in your bed, whatever it is, on your, on your couch and lie down. And with me, take a deep breath, right? In and out, right? And feel into your body. And notice, where is your tension? For me, it's in my shoulders, it's in my chest, it's in my stomach, and it's in my right leg. So as you're laying down, I want you to scan your body for tension, right? Start with the top of your head and feel if there's any tension on your scalp, and then move to your face and feel if any part of your face is holding tension, whether it be your eyebrows, a lot of people hold them in their cheeks. A lot of people hold them in their jaw. If you have it in your jaw, can you relax your jaw? All right? So many of us clench. And that is a surefire sign that we're in sympathetic mode. We are clenching. We are bracing. What about our neck? Oh, my Lord. When we get a massage, we feel that tension. And so many of us hold tons and tons of tension on our neck. What about our shoulders? That's where I hold mine. Do we have it in our shoulders? When you're laying down, are your shoulders upright or are they flat on the mat or the couch or the bed or the floor, wherever you're laying? Are they flat? And what about your chest? For me, that's where I hold the most amount of tension, right? And if you do hold tension in your chest, that might just be you not wanting to open up your heart, right? And think about your posture. If you're protecting your chest, if you're protecting your heart, or have your posture back and expanding and exposing your heart, right? Think about that. There's different parts of the body that really map different parts of our emotions. And I'll do a whole show on that, I promise. But keep scanning. Go back to your stomach. Any tension on there. A lot of us hold tension in our stomach. Why? Because we're sucking in our stomachs all the time, right? We're walking around with our stomachs sucked in. We're shallow breathing in our chest. Of course, we're creating tightness in our fascia. Can you breathe? Can you even belly breathe? Or are you finding resistance? What about our hips? Tons of people have so much stress and trauma and tension on their hips. That's why when we see hip releases in medicine, people cry. So do you have it in your hips? How about your legs? Go down your legs. What about your calves? What about your feet? And find if you found tension in one or more places in your body, then it may be indicated for you to do this practice to get back into your body. And the reason, and we can all get up, I just was just a scan for us to understand if we're holding tension in our body. And I guarantee nine out of 10 people who've listened to this is holding tension. Why? Because we don't make time for ourselves to get back in our body. The people who aren't holding tension are likely the people who have very strong body awareness. The people who are dancers, right? The people who are, are in fitness, the people who are doing yoga all the time, that's the type of people who have really good body awareness. Or you can be an outliner and you could just really know your body well. But people like me and a lot of us don't have that awareness around tension in our body. We don't fall and we don't highlight those subtleties when we know, okay, actually I was super open, right? No tension. And then now I'm at 10% tension. But it's that delicate subtlety to feel into so we know if we have tension in our body. So... One thing, which I learned yesterday on the mat with these beautiful, amazing, kind-hearted people, the love gurus, they uh, taught me an amazing breath. And, and it's simply just breathing from the stomach, right? And not forcing it, right? Because I remember they're like, breathe from your stomach. I'm like, yes, I can breathe from my stomach. I've done breath work before. And I'm like aggressively breathing from my stomach and then breathing into my chest, but aggressively breathing into my chest. And they go, We're now release from your throat, right? Make a sound. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, and they go, okay. All right, uh, less posturing and more just 
being. And I was like, being, okay, I, I guess I can come back to being. Uh, so I relaxed and I let the air flow, right? My stomach went up, the air was filling up, then the air flowed into my chest, right? Naturally flowed. I didn't push it up. It naturally flowed into my chest. And all of a sudden my chest expanded, my heart expanded, my shoulders went down. And then I pushed that air out through my throat in the form of sound. If any of us were listening and we're carrying tension, which is a lot of you, I uh, highly suggest this practice that they taught me. And it's just to lay down and do that breath, naturally breathing into the stomach, bringing it into your chest, right? Naturally, not forcing it, stomach to chest, and then inviting it right out of your throat and coming out as a, uh, you'll notice you only really need five to 10 of those and the tension is out of your body. Another amazing practice that they taught me is to put my hand on where I have tension. You know, your body communicates with you. Your body is more intelligent than any doctor out there, any physician, any scientist, anything. There is an elegant, exquisite intelligence to the body, which we in science will never understand because it's out of the consciousness of the human mind. But, but we can communicate with our bodies. So when you're laying down, especially when you're quiet, put your hand on where your tension is and, and ask your body, what does it need right now in this moment? And the first thing that comes to your head, the first word that comes into your head is likely exactly what you need. Now, whether that's your body or subconscious talking to you or your body is your subconscious, regardless, if you honor that, more likely than not, you're going to feel better and you're going to feel better fast. So remember, the tension in your body is blocking you from your highest health physically. The tension in your body is blocking you from your deepest love emotionally. The tension in your body is blocking you from your intuition spiritually. So it stands to believe that if you carry tension, let's dedicate ourselves to five to 10 breaths like that and release that tension from our body because our very state after we release that tension is our default state, our God-given state, and we deserve to be there every single day. So try that out. I love you all. There's a knowledge bomb. We're going to get to the special guest segment. I can't wait to talk about fermenting foods. I know it's a shift, but it's a good shift because your gut health is so, so important. So let's get into this combo. All right, everyone. Today's special guest, listen, I've been using these products. And I remember two years ago, I had this beautiful coconut milky fermented drink. And I was like, it caught my eye so fast and I tasted it and it was delicious. And it was from the Fermenting Fairy. And then a few weeks later, I get a message from her in synchronicity. And then she comes to the studio, Lauren, and drops it off. But today, finally, a few years later, we have her on the show to talk about all things fermented food. Lauren Monez is the fermented fairy and she is the fermenting queen. And you know how much I love fermenting foods for the gut, for overall health, for inflammation. It's something I do before every single meal. Thank you for joining us all the way from Florida. Mm, thank you, Dr. G. It's such an honor to be here because I listen to your podcast all the time. So to be here as a guest is uh, wonderful. It's it's an honor. Actually, I don't think most of my guests ever listen to my podcast. I think you're the only one. So I'm excited to have, oh. <laughs> to have you on here. It's a pleasure. No, we we both share in common a love for uh, the cold plunge. You just told me you have one, the same one that I have in your house. So you and I both love nature in many ways. And big part of nature is fermentation and fermented foods, something we evolved with for so long. How did you out of all of the careers in the world, get into the fermenting food industry? <laughs> well, it, I, it really wasn't my choice. It's, you know, I like to say it's my dharma. It's my path. You know, this is what I am here to do and here to offer the world. Because essentially, I was not looking to change my career. I was an occupational therapist. I was happy there and, you know, helping people of, of service. And then um, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. I got extremely sick. This was about seven years ago. And I healed myself. Once I dove in and I figured out what Crohn's really is, other than what I was told it is, which is an autoimmune disease, which I 
you know, disagree with the, or at least the foundation of what an autoimmune disease is, gut dysbiosis and leaky gut. Once I figured that out and I dove head first into how to heal my gut and fermented foods were really crucial in that. And I started doing it at home and I fell in love with the process. I mean, not only was it healing my body, but spiritually it completely changed my life. Um, because here's like a world that we can't see, we can't hear, we can't taste, we can't smell the microbial world. And yet here it is healing my body. And I, I spent my whole life trying to kill these organisms, you know, through washing hands with antibacterial soap, you know, Purell and, you know, Lysol and just thinking. Antibiotics. Oh my God, antibiotics, number one. And thinking that these things were deadly to my system. And again, here I am watching a jar of cabbage turn into sauerkraut. And when I eat that sauerkraut, I feel amazing. It's just like, it, it still is mind blowing to me even, you know, four and a half years later. So, and I healed myself with, um, you know, naturally through my ferments. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm in full agreement that I think, I think fermented foods are, should be a staple of, of our day every single day. I mentioned to you in the beginning of the show is that I have a jar of kimchi and now the, the beautiful package that you sent me of all the goodies mm -hmm. in my refrigerator. And I'll, I'll take a spoonful it's for me, it's like therapeutic. It's my supplement before meals. Mm, and I'll I take, I'll, I'll take a little bit of the fermented food, eat, and then I'll start preparing my food mm. and then I'll eat my meal. But at least I know I'm getting it two, three times a day. But there is a palpable difference between how my gut feels, whether it's because I do tend to be bloated and some heartburn versus when I do it versus when I don't. Mm. When I do it, it's like everything's calm. Mm. Even my nervous system is, it's beyond gut. It's like my nervous system is calm. I feel good in my body. Um, but for, for you, you were diagnosed with Crohn's. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Like, how did it start for you? How did you know? What were your symptoms? How bad was it? And then where did fermented foods come in? Did you read an article? Did you he overhear a doctor saying it or a practitioner saying it? Mm. And then how did you take it upon yourself to go, I'm going to start fermenting my own food? <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I was in my mid-30s. And if you had looked at me from the outside, uh, you would have said, wow, she's like super healthy because I was racing triathlons um, several times a year at that point in my life. And I was waking up at 3 a.m. to ride my bike about 40 miles. And I would come home and work an eight-hour day as an occupational therapist. Wow. And I'd come home and I'd swim in the pool and you know, I was fit, you know, and yet um, I was sick and I was, I, I've been fairly sick, like on and off my entire life, but mid thirties, it really hit me. And I started getting sicker and sicker. And, and what that looked like for me was mainly going to the bathroom with very watery diarrhea um, about 20 times a day. And mm. I would eat and immediately I was in the bathroom. So it was like rapid transit. The food that I ate was in the toilet bowl. There was nothing being absorbed. Wow. Nothing was being digested. So, you know, I was like, I got to the point where my heart was like leaping out of my chest from just walking five steps. I was severely malnourished. And um, the point, and I was... I was really resisting a colonoscopy for the longest time, but I was going to see Western and Eastern doctors and homeopaths and all that. And um, the point, the breaking point for me was I started having accidents. So I was, I would leave my house and, you know, five minutes later I was going to the bathroom in my pants, you know, and I had to travel with toilet paper. I had to travel with pants and underwear. It, it just consumed my life. I was, in my mid thirties, I was ready to be married to, you know, this man that previous relationship. So it was embarrassing, you know, to be pooping in my pants. I was incontinent. So that was the breaking point for me. And I went and I got a colonoscopy and sure enough, I was diagnosed with, uh, you know, IBD. Um, and I went home, I took medication. I was told by my doctor that Crohn's is incurable. 
I would have it for the rest of my life. I was also told that the medication I'd have to stay on for the rest of my life um, because I was so severely malnourished. I'd lost a lot of weight. And I was told that just to go home, eat ice cream, bread, whatever you can get in your mouth and gain that weight back. And that food had nothing to do with the activity of the disease. Okay, so all of all of that I was told. And here I am going from racing triathlons to this information. And I just was like spun. You know, I just didn't even know like where my life had, had gone. But it was interesting because when the doctor said, just like go home and eat anything, food has nothing to do with the activity of the disease. That, that really alerted me to a red flag. And I was awake enough and aware enough to say, there's something wrong there. So I, I went, I said, okay, what diet am I going to adopt now? Like what food is good for me? And so I went to Barnes and Nobles, the one in Santa Monica, it's no longer there. But uh, I went to Barnes and Nobles and started sifting through all the books, found, it's called The Paleo Approach by Sarah Ballantine. I don't know if you know it, but it's Mm -hmm. huge, like maybe 600 page book, skimming through it. Little paragraph says fermented foods. I mean, tiny, maybe five sentences. Fermented foods could be good for autoimmune disease. I said, all right, well, I'll just go to the health food store and get a jar of sauerkraut. Um, And I did. And I took my first bite and I had this like kundalini awakening. It was just this rush of energy surging through my body. And it just like woke me up. And I was like, what in the world was that? The next few days, I continued to consume sauerkraut, one or two tablespoons, and my stool started forming. And that's when I was like, oh my God, there is something to this. And so I started researching fermented foods and gut health and what really is Crohn's because it's not, why am I suppressing my immune system with these medications? It's actually not my immune system. It's doing its job. It's my gut. And that's why the fermented foods are really helping. So I decided to watch YouTube videos and read books on fermentation. And I decided to do my first uh, foray into sauerkraut. And I ended up throwing that out because I couldn't stomach eating something that's been rotting on my counter for eight days. Right, so right. I threw it out, made it again, and I ended up eating it. And I fell in love with the process and... And that was it. I mean, that was like my obsession and infatuation with uh, gut health, my, microorganisms, fermentation. Yeah. I love. I love to hear that is your dharma because you went through this process, right? That it's sort of like a hero's journey, heroine's journey, right? You went through this process where you were sick and down in the dumps and really, really hurting in many ways, and you brought yourself to a small paragraph in a 600 page book that led you to your purpose. Right. And, and I've had that before. Like, I'm like, Oh my God, I really need to be eating these foods because you feel your body become alive. Yeah. It's sort of like, like a Kundalini, like you're like, there's an energetic spike just flows through you. And you're like, Whoa, 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 whoa. That felt really good. I need to eat more of this. <laughs> and it's incredible how the body talks to you. It's like amongst a few bites, your body was like, please more of this. And um, yes. to think that you started, like, imagine I'm a doctor who doesn't recommend fermented foods. I have, I have the best medication, though, to suppress your immune system. And then you're telling me your stools are forming. That has to be mind-blowing, right? They're like, what are you, what are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm just <laughs> eating sauerkraut. And they're like, whoa, 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 who told you to eat sauerkraut, you know? And to hear your stools have been formed is so amazing to just hear how the body works so beautifully. For someone like me, who's totally unfamiliar with this process, how do you take cabbage or, or um, what is kimchi, kimchi's cabbage also, or anything fermented soy? How do you, what do you do? How does the process happen such that all of a sudden it becomes fermented? How long does it take? Does it vary with different foods? Just so we understand how that process looks. Mm, Well, that's a loaded question, but I love it. So let's, let's try to tackle that. 
It really depends on what type of fermentation you're talking about. My favorite and what my products are, are anaerobic lacto-fermented fermentation. So um, also I like to call it wild fermentation, and that's going to play a role in our later discussion. But so basically you have, let's just go to sauerkraut because I think a lot of people can, can connect to that. So what wild fermentation is or lacto-fermentation is you take a head of sauerkraut, I'm sorry, a head of cabbage that's been grown in hopefully organic regenerative soil that has trillions and trillions and trillions of microbes in the soil itself. The cabbage grows in that soil and the microbes um, enter the cell walls, the outside of it, the skin, um, everything. I mean, they're just everywhere. And so what I do is I take that head of cabbage that's organically grown and it already has microorganisms on it. And I create a vessel that takes away oxygen. So it's an anaerobic process, no oxygen. So basically I put cabbage in a vessel with uh, either water or juices of the cabbage, a little bit of salt, put a cap on it. And eight days later, you're going to have sauerkraut. So that's called a lacto-fermentation or a wild fermentation because I'm not adding in bacteria or yeast or fungi. I'm letting nature do its thing. So what happens is all of those microbes that were on that head of cabbage, now they start eating away and chomping away at the sugars and the carbohydrates, and they start producing acids, and they start lowering the pH, and pretty soon that cabbage completely transforms, it's alchemy, completely transforms into sauerkraut, which is totally different than where we started initially. I, I just hearing this process is like amazing to me because that is alchemy. It's like nature transforming in some beautiful process where bacteria is working in conjunction with the ca with the cabbage, working in conjunction to produce, produce byproducts for us that help us. Yes. So, so to understand, you have this cabbage, head of, head of uh, cabbage that is in organic soil or soil that is exposing it to microbes, and then you're cutting off air. And those microbes, what is the point of cutting off the air? Uh, because they're, they're, the microbes um, are more anaerobic, so they don't like oxygen. So here's, a, here's another visual for you and, and your listeners. If you took that same head of cabbage and you just put it on the counter for eight days, what would happen to it? It would rot. Yeah, it would rot. Yeah. And that's because of oxygen. It would oxidize. So the, the um, microorganisms are lactic acid bacteria, most of them. They don't like oxygen. And so when they, they, when they proliferate and they go into the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the billions and the trillions in numbers, that's because they're in a vessel that has no oxygen. That's, their, that's, that's what they grow in. Otherwise, they don't grow. It's just oxygen hits the, the product, the, the produce, and it starts to rot. Now, mm. when you talk about, let, let's say, kombucha, when you talk about kombucha, that's actually an aerobic. So it's an aerobic. So kombucha needs oxygen to ferment. So that's a different Co process. Kombucha. kombucha. Okay. Okay. So the, the completely different process. So it different is. foods or fermented foods have different process, not all exactly. of them utilize anaerobic. Right. Right, right, right. Exactly. That's why, you know, all of my products, I prefer a lacto um, anaerobic process. I just, I, I personally feel like it's a healthier kind of fermentation. Um, but yeah, different foods will have different processes. Mm, okay. Yeah. So you mentioned kombucha then. I, wa I want to know all about this because this is the hottest product when it comes to the health industry, especially in the past few years. I mean, we were talking off air how when I was, I mean, maybe it was like 2014, I was at Whole Foods and I was like getting into this kombucha brand. And I was like, okay, yeah, I really like this flavor. I think it was Dr. Bruce. And I was like, I like this flavor. I like this flavor. But there wasn't really any other brands. It was like GT's Kombucha and Dr. Bruce and maybe the Synergy, a few of them. But I mm -hmm. tell you right now, I go to Whole Foods or over here in uh, Venice, Air One, Santa Monica, Air One. There's tons of kombucha brands now. And I was talking about, my concern is 
the quality, it always happens. When the quality gets diluted as the industry starts getting bigger, am I right then that the quality is getting diluted? And if so, how? Is, is, is kombucha even healthy? Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the quality, not only is it getting diluted, but it's been so interesting the last year to see kombucha changing right now because it's, you can't even call it traditional kombucha anymore. There are microorganisms that are being introduced to the three largest kombucha companies that shouldn't be in kombucha, that naturally aren't in kombucha. And so I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that. So you have, um, there's two industries happening right now, and this is really important to watch because pretty soon one is going to overtake the other. So you have the fermented food industry, and that's products like kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, you know, the stuff that you and I are talking about. Those are fermented foods. And like I described, they have to have some kind of alchemical process to them. So you have one form of food that changes into a completely different other form through microorganisms. That's fermented foods. Then now, recently in the last couple of years, you have the probiotic food industry. This is now overlapping the fermented food industry. What the probiotic food industry is now is it's your protein powder that is marketed as gut health, your protein bars, your chips that are gut health, your juices that are probiotic now, your everything, coffee is probiotic now. So you have this whole world of other foods that normally wouldn't be probiotic in nature, right? Protein powder, no. But now it is, and it's because of one single player, and that is bacillus coagulin. So bacillus coagulin is naturally formed, uh, is is naturally found in the microbiome of of the earth. It's a spore based bacteria. Um. It is extremely hardy. You can pasteurize it. You can boil. You can uh, high pressure. You can freeze it. It's going to survive everything. It survives high pH, low pH. And recently, a couple of years ago, it, so it's 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 new to the food industry. It was it has been used in industrial products like paint. Now it's being used in food. And it's considered by the FDA to be a food additive. It's not even a microorganism anymore. It's a food additive. And um, a company called Ganadin a a few years ago popularized it, took it to the lab and created it and basically uh, genetically modified it and patented it and made it very, very popular. And they have now been bought by the Carey Group, which is a biotech, huge biotech firm. So it's, we're talking big food and big pharma are now involved with this. Um, and it's bacillus coagulant. So they have patents on it. They, ha- they have genetically modified this natural spore-based bacteria. And it is in everything. So everything that you and I buy that says gut health or probiotic, that's not a fermented food turn it around, look at the ingredients, and you'll see bacillus coagulin. And so why bring this up, tying it back to the kombucha? Kombucha doesn't have, shouldn't have bacillus coagulin in it. But now if you look at the top three, Kavita, GTs, and HealthAid, they're all using it. They have it on their labels now. And I've been watching this. First it was Kavita, then it was HealthAid, now it's GT is doing it. And so what that's telling me, I don't know for sure, 100%, but what it's telling me is um, probably big food has gotten their nose stuck in it and they're most likely pasteurizing the kombucha and having this bacillus, bacillus coagulant either added back in or it remains. Um, but so it's not really even a traditional kombucha anymore. So you talk about watered down. I'm talking about a completely different product that we can't call kombucha. 
And it's using this laboratory-derived, genetically modified, patented thing, you know, food additive. It's, it's not even a microorganism. It's incredible to hear because so many people say, I drink kombucha because it's healthy. I drink kombucha because it's good for gut health. It's a prebiotic food. It's a fermented food. I read in this blog. I read in this book. And kombucha really has, like, in many ways, spearheaded the popularity of fermenting foods. And as I mentioned, you see it in the, in the stores. But for me, to hear the really big brands, not surprising, but it's still interesting because when it, big industry gets involved, like you said, pasteurized? I mean, you mean to tell me all of the good microbes that serve our yeah. gut are killed, and then they're, they're just adding on this, this very hardy, as you mentioned, microbe, but industrialized, uh, utilized for just popularity and really taking away. It's not kombucha, is it? Really, we, kombucha not. is the product before it was. So, so for the um, b- bacillus coagulans, they, um, that, that bacteria, is that found in fermented foods usually, or is this really alien to fermented foods in general? Yeah, that's a great question. It's not, I mean, if you do a wild fermentation that is anaerobic, there's a possibility that you'll have some bacillus in it. Um, but it's not its not one of the main guys there. You know, you're mm-hmm. going to have more lactobacillus. You're going to have some bifidum. You're going to have some saccharomycin. You're not really going to find bacillus in it, you know, in fermented foods. Um, and you most definitely won't find them in kombucha that uses a SCOBY, you know, a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast, you won't find bacillus coagulant in it. And um, so, you know, this is, this is dangerous for several reasons. But one is that, you know, pretty soon, probably within the next couple of years, the whole fermented food industry is probably going to turn to the same processes, you know, using this bacillus coagulant, either because the FDA is making them, I don't know, or because it does extend the shelf life at least three years. You know, this thing is super hardy. Um, Extend shelf life, makes the process really easier. Uh, You can scale, you can scale a company really easily by just adding that in. Um, so it's it's more profit for companies. It's very attractive. But what's going to happen is pretty soon we're going to find that in all of our food and we're going to develop a monoculture in our gut, um, which is the absolute number one cause of disease is monoculture. The decrease of microbial diversity is the number one cause of disease. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man, I love I love this conversation because <laughs> I'm so passionate about about fermented foods because I know how they've helped me and more dramatically have helped you. Um, but many people, you know, I always tell my friends if you're not getting one to two servings a day, then you're missing this boat, right? Because when I was in practice and I was doing stool tests, I saw massive lacks in diversity for people. Mm. We were lacking. I mean, it was like you you see the general population of healthy individuals with healthy stools and healthy diversity. And then it, it, it was just, it was just, where was it? It was depleted. And I was like, you guys, you don't even have this, this species or this species. And yeah. it's funny because when we start introducing fermented foods, you can do that stool test again in three to six months. And it, the diversity just expands. It, like It's like a garden just growing new species. Oh, you're like, I didn't know I had that flower. Whoa, I didn't know I had that cabbage species growing. What's this flower doing? Yeah. And it's beautiful. But you're so right. You're so right because we we throw atomic bombs at the gut microbes, you know, mm-hmm. like in the form of antibiotics. And then we, we get, we're surprised when we have like very little diversity or, or little species and then, you know, disease happens. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I love the conversation about kombucha because a lot of people who are listening and viewing are going, I drink kombucha. What the heck? What's happening? So then the, naturally, are there brands? Okay, so how do we look for kombucha then? Do you, are there brands or like, is there anything we look, look for in the back to know, okay, I'm going to avoid this product that shouldn't even be called kombucha and go back to the traditional kombucha? Or do we have to just make our own? How do we do it? 
Well, I mean, I, I, first and foremost, I advise against drinking kombucha. Um, I see a mm-hmm. lot of issues with it, a lot of issues that outnumber the benefits. And to me, there's other fermented drinks that are more beneficial. So why risk it? One thing that is often not brought up with kombucha is the possibility of massive amounts of fluoride in kombucha. Um, because we don't think about where was the tea grown? First of all, where, where was the tea plant grown? Was it most likely commercial kombucha companies are not using very, very high quality tea leaves. They're using the cheap stuff. Even if it's organic, it's still cheap. Probably grown in China or India where, you know, the farming practices aren't, you know, uh, right. high standards. And who knows what kind of water they're using. Um, so the tea leaves, you know, they, they hold the toxins in their, t- in the leaves. And so you go and you make tea and there's a possibility of heavy metals and fluorides in that. And then on top of that is when you look at a, a kombucha label, you see usually green tea or black tea. Okay. Or, and even if it's organic, organic black tea. Okay. But in order to make tea, you need water. So tell me what kind of water source you're using to make that tea. And I don't really find that on labels. And that scares me because you could just be using tap water to make the tea. And, you know, you know better than anyone what's in that tap water, which is a ton of fluoride and neurotoxin and heavy metals and medicines and pharmaceuticals and plastics, yeah, everything. Yeah. And... And the um, kombu- the kombucha scoby is also more of a, a bioabsorbent. It's it it sucks that in, you know. It sequesters heavy metals. It sequesters toxins, and so you're, you know, you're you're exacerbating. If there's any kind of fluoride or heavy metal, you're actually exacerbating it in the in the kombucha fermentation process. That's that's so. incredible to hear because we don't think about that and and the sugar. Usually it's really the sugar. high amounts of sugar in these drinks. So then I'm, I'm thinking and I'm like, wait. And it's funny because you, some people won't catch this, but it'll be the serving size will be for half the bottle, half the yes. bottle. But most people just drink the whole bottle on their ride back from Whole Foods or something. But you see the serving size for half the bottle. It's like, oh, 12 grams of sugar. They're like, oh, it's not that bad thinking it's a whole bottle. But really, I think it's 24, 25 grams of sugar added on to make it taste good. But I never thought about the, yeah. the filtered, not unfiltered water used. And may, may, no company says filtered reverse osmosis water. No, they don't. Yeah, exactly. And I I try to urge everyone, any kind of packaged food you're buying, whether it's a bar or whatever, whatever you're buying that's in a package, um, look to see what the water source is. If it just says water, trust me, they're using tap water because we use filtered water. And I'm going to put that on my label because what does that do? That takes my product to the next level. You know, I'm spending money on my filtration. I'm going to let you know that, you know, as a consumer. For sure. If you're just using tap water, I mean, you're just going to list it as water. And I would just throw that out. And kombucha uses a lot of water because it's tea. So unlike other ferments that don't use a lot of water or don't use any water, kombucha uses a lot of water. So water source is key. And also air quality is key because kombucha is an open air vessel. I mean, you can put something on it to keep out like big particles, but it's, it needs oxygen. So air quality is really key. So what's in our air, you know, like what kind of pollutants are dropping in there and, you know, so. It's, it's, it, I'm, I'm over here thinking if I ever made kombucha, what I would use, I'd use like really high quality reverse osmosis water or filtered water. I'd have a big air filter in the lab or wherever it's being made. <laughs> and it's, because, because really is kombucha, you're, you're right, like the, there's benefits there, but the, there's so many costs. So to summarize, you were talking about the quality of the tea leaves. And for people listening and viewing, as a reminder, tea leaves soak up heavy metals. They're really good at it. Um, so soaking up of tea leaves, heavy metals and toxins, where is it coming from? If it's China and Indian, could be really big red flag. The water that's being used, 
Uh, you mentioned the, the, the quality of the water can be really poor. As we know, what's in tap water, I did a whole show on that. And then the air quality, those are all costs. And then the benefit is just like, it can help my gut versus really something where we can go with like a sauerkraut or, or a, a miso or a tempeh or something like that, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. It's be- it's and then, and, yeah, ahead, it's, oh yeah, there's much better quality. Um, uh, to me, there's a hierarchy of fermented foods um, and kombucha is at the bottom rung, you know, because it's like, you know, okay, so it's better than soda. Like a lot of kombucha companies will say, well, you know, yeah, we have 20 grams per 16 ounce or 12 ounce of sugar, but Coke, you know, soda has 60 grams and orange juice has 30 grams of sugar. Right. And they try to compare it. And to me, it's like, okay, so, and I'm not bashing sugar. I think we do need some sugar on a daily basis, but there's people who drink kombucha every day. They drink two or three bottles every day, and then they're getting sugar from food. And it's just, you're not thinking that that kombucha is like your max for sugar for the day. And that's even yeah. overdoing it. So let, let me tell let me tell you what happens to me when I drink uh, GT's kombucha or the Synergy or yeah Synergy one GT is Synergy is the other one right yeah. GT and Synergy I haven't drank I think Synergy years. is GT's yeah GT Synergy there's the other one the other pit really oh there must be Kavita then okay. every single time I drink kombucha without fail it activates my psoriasis and I'm itching my elbows wow. are itching. My knees are itching that day. I'm talking about like four hours later, every day. And I, I remember when I was younger, I used to uh, work part in school. I used to work part time at this like holistic pharmacy, and they they had like uh, a pharmacy on the side, but then they had like really cool supplements, and like they had a, in the back, they had like a whole fridge full of kombucha, and I would grab some for lunch, and I dr- I would drink it every you know three times a week. It took me so long to connect. Why the heck I would itch? I was I, I actually thought it was the the air of the. I thought there was mold in the, <laughs> the pharmacy before I thought it was the kombucha. Mm. So I would actually urge people: if you're drinking kombucha every single day, think if your body is changing for the worse, right? Because we mm-hmm. may not ever think, but it absolutely could be for the reasons we spoke about. So you mentioned the hierarchy. What are some of the best fermented foods that we can start incorporating then? Uh, to me, the very, very top is milk kefir, and that doesn't have to be dairy. It could be a plant-based milk kefir. Like mine is coconut milk. Um, there's other people who do a cashew or an almond milk kefir, but you're still using the milk kefir grains. So mm-hmm. just like a lot of people are familiar with the mushroom scoby of the kombucha, kefir, milk kefir has its own scoby, but it looks like curd cheese. And that's a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast as well. And so you can use that, those kefir grains in any kind of milk, whether it be dairy, goat, you know, um, or plant-based. That to me is the highest because it's got the most amount of diversity. It's got over 50 strains, you know, more or less. And there are some strains in there that actually take up residence in your gut. So they're not just transient where they hang out two or three days and make you feel good and then you poop them out. There are actually uh, microorganisms in milk kefir that take up residence and they become part of your commensal bacteria. So um, that's really the most effective. And with my company, I see it just in the feedback that I've gotten over the last four years, like your kefir changed my life, your kefir, blah, 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 blah. So... Um, milk kefir is really the highest. And then you have the fermented veggies that I think are second. You know, you have the sauerkraut, um, the fermented daikon, the kimchi, um, Mm -hmm. you know, anything that's vegetable oriented, fermented carrots, even pickles when they're lacto-fermented, um, super, super healthy and will impart, um, a lot of benefit on your, in your body. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say going down, maybe some of the soy, like miso, is super healthy. Um, Water kefir, not so much. I'm finding that water kefir commercially made is going the same route as kombucha, and it's just really diluted, full of sugar, just not all that healthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and, uh, and 
actually seen water kefir. It was weird. I was like, what is this? I've never, I, I thought kefir was supposed to be like coconut milk or some sort of milk. And um, it was interesting to see that. Okay, so yeah, thank you for that hierarchy. It gives us, it gives us some perspective. Um, I guess before we sign off, can you tell us a little bit about fermenting fairy? I know you use you use really uh, a high quality process, which you fully believe in, and is the is from what I'm understanding the best process to use. But um, what are some? What do we have? What are some of the products that you have on on the on the SKUs? Because I I've I've gotten a bunch of goodies and and I haven't even opened some of them. I have yet to try the ginger or the caraway caraway seed one, which is like so intriguing to me. But tell us a little bit about the flavors because I want to urge everyone who's viewing and listening to go get some because I want you to get high quality fermented foods. And at this point, this is the best brand that I know. Mm, thank you so much. Um, that means a lot. Um, I would say two things that set my company apart than other companies. One is that we do a wild fermentation. We never, ever add a freeze-dried, lab-derived microorganism. So everything is from nature. And the other thing is I have taken, and these are all my own recipes that I've created. Um, I've taken very familiar foods like applesauce and lemonade, <clears throat> and I've turned them into a fermented product, which to me gives more of a vast number of people access to fermented foods. It's not so like, ugh, like sauerkraut. You know, a lot of people are way turned off to sauerkraut, but who doesn't love lemonade and applesauce, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so I created a fermented product out of that so that babies can have it and elders can have it and everywhere in between pregnant women can have it. So that really sets us apart. And the flavors, they're actually good and delicious. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. It's true. I, I attest to that. I had the um, applesauce yesterday after dinner. I had two scoops. It was like a little bit like my dessert. Um, it was really, really good. And I love that you mentioned babies because we can start giving this food early on and I, no baby's going to really chew on sauerkraut. But a baby can eat applesauce. And instead of having the mats you know, 18 grams of sugar, yep. poor quality sprayed apples. Now we have something with quality. So I love that you're doing that. Um, oh yeah, to, to pique our interest, any plans for the future? Um, any any expansion of anything? Are you writing a blog, writing a book? I'd love to know anything that, that we can get excited about. Um, so we just came out with a sourdough, uh, a kefir sourdough recipe, and it's a do-it-yourself kit. And that has been so phenomenal because... Um, this is bread that's 100% gluten that after the fermentation process, because of the kefir and the sourdough starter, um, is rendered nearly gluten-free. And I have wow. people who are celiac who are eating it. I have people who are, get severe reactions to gluten who are eating it. They're making their own bread with the kit that we give them. So that's been really, really fun. Um, I have plans on a lot more products. It, it, probably my next one is going to be a skincare, either like a lotion or a face, facial wash, um, which Love I'm that. excited about. Yeah. Love that. And my, my skin, my skin microbes are getting really excited over that. <laughs> <laughs> I see them. <laughs> I know we're getting really excited. And sorry, sorry, I interrupted you. And, and, and what else? Oh, it, I think just creating courses. I have no plans to write a book. I, I just, ugh, I don't have time. Um, but maybe like a course uh, on, on, you know, gut and maybe fermentation. But yeah, just really building my company. Oh, another thing that I would love to do that's in the works um, is creating a pet food uh, company, like on the side of Fermenting Fairy, mm. because... I give my dog and my cats kefir every day and they love it. Um, and it's much needed for our animals. Like they're, they're suffering as much as we are. Yes, yes, yes. I have, I've had like one of the biggest voices in pet medicine on here and I had a canine behavioralist and they are huge on I watch the quality that of food. Yeah, and yeah. how we're, it's suffering. Our, our, our animals' guts are suffering. And that's a whole nother conversation. But it's, it's I mean, like, my girlfriend will bring her dog over and I'm like, pesticides, be careful. We have to have high quality food. We're going to clean your dog's snout. We're going to clean the feet. We're going to brush the dog. We're going to make sure that your dog is healthy as it's ever been. And, you know, we, mm. we all love our, our, our best friends. So thank you for, and I'd love to 
be in the loop of that. So just let me know how that turns out and um, in the skincare. Okay. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Dropping some fermenting bombs. Fermenting Fairy is the brand. Um, you'll see it on my story. And yeah, we'll link it. We'll link it on the on the uh, show notes. But thank you so much from Florida. Lauren, I appreciate you. Thanks, Dr. G. Appreciate it. I'm very honored to be here with you. Thank you. I'm honored too.